Welcome to All in Yellow. The official Norwich City podcast. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the All in Yellow podcast. Today we have a man who's been a key part of the journey under Stuart Webber and Daniel Farker. It's club captain Grant Hanley. Grant, great to see you today. Thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you? Yeah, no, all good. Thanks. Very well. Um, looking forward to doing this, actually. Good. Well, we're looking forward to having you as well. You must be very happy with how the season's shaping up so far. Obviously, flying high at the top of the championship. Yeah, no, it's been good. Um, you know, I think we feel like we've been fairly consistent, which um, you know, in the championship is, you know, probably the most important factor. So, you know, positive so far. And, um, you know, we're just looking to carry that on and, um, you know, be up top end of the table come, uh, uh, you know, the end of the season. What's the mood around uh, the place like, Grant? Because it's a bit of a different vibe to last time we were promoted obviously we were all celebrating in the stadium but you're almost having to do it on your own the boys at the moment How, how's that felt no it's it's very different um you know and I think it's um you know it's, it's very strange times obviously as everyone knows and you know to be doing so well it's it's uh you know it's difficult not to have the fans there because obviously they play a massive part in it um you know especially for us at, at Carroll Roads you know there's been games where it was We've scored goals, and you know you can just imagine what the reaction would have been. Um, and also, there's been there's been times where it's been tough for us, and you know the fans made a big difference. Um, so you know it, it's been difficult. It's been um, and it's been it's been very strange, but you know it is what it is, and you know the players have got to be professional, and and uh, you know we've got a job to do, and you know we're doing it fairly well at the minute, so we just need to focus on carrying that on. Yeah, you really are doing it very well, as you say. But the atmosphere at training must be really good, given where we are in the table. But how much has COVID changed things? You know, is your day-to-day routine fairly similar to how it was before, or has it altered quite a bit? I mean, there's obviously protocols in place that, um, you know, you need to follow. And obviously, everybody's got to be, you know, as careful as they can be. Um, Obviously, we're getting the, the testing twice a week, so that's, you know, a little bit of peace of mind for the players and lads that have got concerns with their families and, and stuff like that. But I mean, it's it's important to sort of keep our processes in, in place as, as much as possible and, um, you know, make it as much as it was before, um, you know, the pandemic and and just sort of follow our processes really and, and try and stick to what, what, what we do and what we know gets us results. Grant, obviously, people talk a lot about a bit of a hangover once you've been relegated to the championship. What do you think the key for you guys has been to avoid that hangover and look on course, hopefully, obviously, for a swift return? Um, it's hard to put your finger on it, really. I think probably the dressing room helps a lot. I mean, I think there's a, we've got a really good group. I think the, there's no egos in the dressing room. I think there's... Um, I think... Teams probably struggle when they get relegated because they've probably got players that think they're too good to be playing in the championship or, you know, they feel like they should be playing in the Premier League. I'm not saying we've not got players that feel like they should be playing in the Premier League, but everybody knows that, you know, they're at Norwich and they've got a job to do for Norwich and they owe a lot to Norwich. Um, so I think that's a very important factor. You know, everybody's on the same boat and everybody's, you know, pulling in the same direction. And I think that, you know, that starts from sort of the recruitment and the... And the um, the lads they sign, I think it's not just about getting, you know, the best player available. I think they probably do their, their research in terms of what type of lads they're bringing in and, you know, everybody they bring in fits into that dressing room well and, um, you know, understands what it takes. And I think also coming from the manager, the, you know, the demands that are set, it's every day the demands are, you know, sky high and it's, that's what I expected. And if, um, you know, if anybody's not pulling their weight, then they know about it and make sure they're, sort of put in a place. Obviously, attitude and character key in this Norwich City squad. But as club captain, do you feel a certain responsibility to make sure that everyone is kind of towing the same party line, I guess? No, I think so. I mean, obviously, as a captain, you've, you've got a responsibility. But I think there's, um, in terms of being a captain, I'm lucky here because there's a really good group of sort of senior lads. Um, you know, if you look around the squad, there is a lot of youth and there's a lot of young lads, but there's also a lot of lads that have, you know, been there and seen it and done it, know what it requires. And um, the, the senior lads sort of set the tone and set the standard for the younger lads. But, you know, I must say that the, the young lads have been brilliant. Their, their attitudes are, t- are setting on. Um, 
you know, the, the temperament they've got is, you know, is first class in terms of, you know, the standards they set for themselves. So, you know, it does it does make it a lot, little bit easier for, you know, as being a captain, as being one of the senior players, um, you know, they, they know what's required and, you know, they set their own standards and um, they know what it takes. I mean, I think it's in terms of um, coming back in for pre-season, you know, we signed a couple of young lads and a couple of young lads were sort of... Um, you know, moving into the first team, I think so. Like, so, you know, Bally Mumba and Sam McCallum, uh, Josh Martin's getting involved, Big Andy as well. So it's when they come in, they see the likes of, you know, for for example, the first few days of pre-season, you've got Ben Godfrey and Jamal Lewis, Max Aarons that are, you know, right at the front of the running. And when the football comes, you know, that the, the standards are sky high. And I think that sort of sets a tone for them in terms of they know how good they need to be if they won't have any chance of playing in the first team. Well, when you first become a captain, I suppose it's like getting a promotion at work where you've been peers with everyone else and suddenly you've got the nod that you're, you're a leader. Did you have to do anything differently to get them to buy into the fact that you were the captain and perhaps had to work more closely with the boss and weren't, I'm sure you're still one of the lads, but had to just behave a little differently? No, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's probably important to do the absolute opposite of that. I think if I was to become captain and change the way I was and, and, and change the way I spoke to people and sort of change the way I acted. And I think I probably would have lost a little bit of respect. I think it's important to, you know, just because you've you've got that role doesn't make you more important. You, you know, you're still part of your team. You've still got to do the same things. So, um, like I said before, that job was made a bit easier because there is, um, you know, there's a lot of senior lads in the dressing room that, you know, if anything's happening or if any decisions need to be made or the lads have got any questions, you know, we sort of come together and, make a decision of how we want to act on that as, as a senior group, which I think is very important for the dressing room as well. Um, you know, to have that trust from the young lads that, you know, they've got the older lads that will look after them and, 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 and help them in that sort of way. And, you know, times have changed as I think years gone by, it's maybe a captain's job was to try and get a night out or an extra day off. And, you know, football's, football's changed and that, that, that's not how it works anymore. And I think it's important that, like I said, having that, that senior group, um, you know, it's very, very important for the dressing room in terms of, you know, building that trust and listening to everybody's opinions and everybody's, if anybody's got any concerns, obviously we've had COVID and lads have had concerns, um, you know, putting that forward and, and making a decision as a group and, you know, whatever decision we make, everybody needs to be happy with. Part of the senior team then, are there many kind of the younger lads in particular that you've had to kind of pay extra attention to over recent months? But I think it's important to you know, sort of treat everybody the same in the dressing room, and obviously the younger lads are, you know, they're a bit, a little bit less experienced, and they, that they're um, in terms of how situations will play out. So it's important to give them advice. But you know, like I said before, the, the the young lads here are, you know, they're they're so professional. It's you, you know, it makes your job easy. Um, so no, I, I mean, I think a lot of credit needs to go to them for you know for their attitudes and you know the the way they approach their their career um, and uh, and how professional they are, really. It's, it's one of those seasons, Grant, where um, we'll talk about it a little bit more, some of the previous seasons and some of the bad luck that you've had, but obviously you're right in the thick of it. And I don't know how much you're on social media or anything, but the fans are absolutely loving you this season and you're getting a lot of love uh, uh, out there. It must feel slightly different to promotion last time because you are right in the thick of it. Yeah, no, I, I think so. And I mean, as a player, you, obviously, you, you want to play every game. And um, last time it was it was tough for me in a sense that, um, you know, I was captain, but I wasn't getting picked. I had an injury. I never got back in the team and, and that's the way it was. But I think um, the way the club is here and, and how you're made to feel when you're here, um, you can't do anything else but give your all for the team. And I think everybody understands that, that, the most important thing here is is the club and the team and and um you know striving towards what our goals are um so it, it sort of makes it easy for you in terms of difficult times when you're not playing as much as you, as you as you would like to to you know to stay on board and stay on track and keep working as hard as as you possibly can to to be ready when you get to get that opportunity so obviously this season's been this season's been 
you know, what I've wanted really. I've, I've had a chance to get a run of games in the team and stay in the team and, you know, find that um, level of consistency where um, you're doing yourself justice, really. You know, to be fit, to be playing every week, to be playing consistent, it's, um, you know, it's what I've wanted. And obviously I've had a couple of seasons where I've not really had a chance to do that for, so far. For me, just to to get a run, a run in the team, and you know, a chance to to do myself justice. Um, you know, that's something that's really pleasing for me. Yeah, what was that like in the season before last? Obviously, going up as as champions up to the Premier League, but having had injury problems, I think was it nine league appearances you made. But obviously, you're the club captain too. How did it feel? Was it a little bit bittersweet seeing how well it was going, and you couldn't have an impact, or was it a case of all about the team, and you were just delighted to see how things were progressing? No, of course. Like I've just said there, I think that when you come here, you you quickly buy into the fact that the team's the most important thing, um, you know, and that's so important for a dressing room, that's so important for success. But, you know, at the same time, on a, on a personal note, I sort of had to put my feelings aside because, you know, you can't lie, you, f- you feel like a little bit of a mug, really. You're supposed to be captain and you're not, you're not playing every week and you're, you know, you're not, you don't feel like you're contributing on the pitch, but... Um, you know, as, as a captain, you've got to sort of see past yourself and you've got to see the bigger picture and you've got to try and do the end out what, what's best for the team. And, you know, I'd like to think that I've done that. Yeah, I suppose you've had a, a similar experience recently with Scotland where they had this incredible, uh, incredible celebration that you were supposed to be a part of. But in the end, you were probably watching at home. And is it OK? Because, you know, OK, they've achieved the target that I've got something else to look forward to. And you're so embedded and want Scotland to do well that you were able to celebrate it. Or again, was that a little bit tough to watch? Yeah, same again, really. But I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, you're probably a fan. I'm a Scotland fan at the end of the day. So to, to see Scotland doing well, obviously, you're absolutely over the moon. And especially knowing, you know, a lot of the lads, um, you know, having been in a lot of squad, squads in the, the past, um, and, you know, and particularly Kenny, Kenny doing well and scoring a couple of important penalties. It was... I think the overriding feeling was, you know, just happiness and 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 proud for the lads and, you know, achieve, achieving something that the country's not achieved in, uh, you know, in a long time. And, you know, I think it'll be great for us. I know you've talked about how playing for your country is kind of something that you grow up wanting to do. Am I right in thinking you captained Scotland at youth level under 19s, was it? Yeah. And, and how has your kind of international career progressed since then? I know you had a couple of years not being called up because of injuries, but then obviously getting that call up for the Serbia game must have been a delight, even if it did end up how it did with the injury. No, of course. I mean, it sort of, uh, sort of got fast-tracked a little bit when I was younger because I played under-19s and then um, got in the first team pretty young. So I sort of bypassed under-21 level and went straight into the... Um, the senior squad set up um, and obviously had a few camps with them and then uh, Gordon Strachan came in and he was great for me. You know, he he played me more often than not. So, you know, that was brilliant for me and I've got, I think, you know, just under 30 caps I think I've got. So, you know, it's something I'm really proud of. But obviously I've had a, a sticky few years in terms of getting caps and I think, you know, really if things that have went different for me at club level, I would have had a lot more, you know, which is, um, which is a bit frustrating. But, you know, it is what it is, and that's that's the way football works sometimes. So, but I think first and foremost for me that the main thing is to is to stay fit and be playing like the regular for Norwich. Yeah, you've got to and, be uh, the Euros, surely. Yeah, well, obviously that's that's um, that's not my decision. Obviously, the only thing I can control is you know maintaining a bit of consistency at, at club level, and you know hopefully the rest takes care of itself. It's interesting what you said there about bypassing the 21s and going straight into the senior team. Take this as a compliment, Grant, but when we signed you, I thought you were much older than you were because I thought this guy's been around for ages. I've seen him playing for Scotland, seen him captaining Blackburn. Um, You really did get a lot of experience at quite an early stage in your career. And and I think we made captain of Blackburn as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that happened quite early. I was 22 and I was made captain at Blackburn. And that was um, that was a bit circumstances controlled that a bit. The club was in a bit of a tough time, um, and I think probably it just sort of ha- happened for me. It sort of looked after itself, and I got the, the role. But 
I mean, it was an experience. I mean, and it, it was it's definitely stood me in good stead in terms of going forward. You know, to have that responsibility at, at such a young age was, um, you know, looking back, it was it was surreal. You know, I see some of the lads in our dressing room that are, you know, 21, 22, 23, and you still feel like they're really young. Um, but I know, I think it de- in long term, it definitely definitely helped me. It didn't feel like at the time, but looking back, that was probably quite tough. You know, I, I never really uh, had a clue what I was doing in some in some aspects of being a captain. But, you know, I think in the long run, definitely, definitely helped me. Was it in you that managers have identified as captain material? Um, not sure, really. I'm not Don't sure, really. <laughs> no, I think, I think maybe on the pitch wise, probably very vocal and an organiser and I think probably just because I'm um, you know I like to set standards and I like to um, you know it, it's difficult it's difficult to, to, to describe it why I mean you're probably better you're probably better asking them but um, you know football's changed and um, lads attitudes towards things are a bit different now and I think maybe I'm maybe a little bit of a throwback and a little bit old school in terms of demands and um, you know the way we communicate. So, and I like to think I'm I'm reasonably fair as well. I think I make decent decisions on things and have a decent opinion on things. So, probably a combination of that. You had all those games for Blackburn, and you've now been with Norwich for sort of three or four years, and, and have got the armband. But in between that, there was a spell at Newcastle, which didn't last as long, and it must have felt like a big move at the time. But how did things work out for you at Newcastle? Why were you not there as long? No, that was obviously that was obviously a tough one, and it was probably the first time in my career that I um, had a little bit of rejection, if you know what I mean. Um, it was one of those moves that seemed to drag on forever. I think it was over a month that it was trying to happen, it was trying to happen, and eventually it got there. Um, and I started the first game of the season for them, and then the next week I wasn't in the squad, so it was obviously a massive blow for me at the time and then after that I never really I only played if there was injuries or he was bringing me on late in games to sort of see a game out so I never really felt like I earned my place in, in, in a team there I never really had a run of games which I think is a big thing for me and I think um, you know people that know me fans that have watched me play they probably know that it takes me three or four games to to sort of get a, into my rhythm and you know, get match sharpness and stuff back, which, um, you know, which is the same for a lot of players. And I just felt like I never really got a chance there. Um, and I don't mean a chance playing in a cup game where you've made seven or eight, nine or ten changes. Um, you know, I mean a chance three or four games. And, you know, I think I'd always back myself to um, to do well and, and do my job as best I could. But, you know, I never really felt like I got that chance. Um, and like I said, it's the first time that I've probably experienced a bit of rejection <clears throat> and I think long term that you know that's an experience that's um that you learn from and uh you know it never worked but you know I wouldn't be the player or the person I am today if I hadn't had that experience so you know I think ultimately I'm grateful for it. You used the word rejection a couple of times there I think it's easy to forget sometimes for people that aren't in the sport that footballers aren't commodities you are all human beings how much does a scenario like that affect your life as a whole, really? Or is it quite easy to switch off and go home and you've got your family life? How do you deal with that kind of situation? No, of course, it affects your life massively because that's um, that's what your life is. Football is your life. For that stage of my life, the age I was, football was everything. And obviously, I had in my mind, I've got to go to Newcastle, I'm going to play every week and I'm going to do well, I'm going to get promoted, I'm going to be playing the Premier League. And... You know, that, that, that never happened. That wasn't to be. Um, so, no, it's tough. And obviously, you take it home with you as well. And it's, it's. Um, I think it's just important to um, to start a, sort of stick with it and to keep doing everything that you can. I think a big thing in football is, you know, you can't have any regrets. You can't, you can't say, I wish I'd tried a bit harder. I wish I'd have done this different I wish I'd have done that different you make your decisions and you've got to stick by them but once you've made them decisions you've got to give all that you can to um to be the best that you can um and I think that's why you know it, it doesn't really hurt me looking back on it because I know that I've done everything that I could and I know that it just wasn't to be and like I said I, I managed to 
um, you know, get my move to Norwich, which I'm very grateful for. And I wouldn't be where I am today if I never had that experience. Grant, what's more challenging to deal with? Being injured and being on the sidelines or not getting picked? Um, it's, a, it's a tough one, really. They're, they're both very similar, but they're, they're both very different. I mean, I think um, be, being injured is, is tough in terms of you want to be in the pitch, you want to be training every day, you miss that, you know, that time in the lads, you miss the travel, you you miss, uh, you know, socialising in the hotels together, you miss the banter, you miss training. And and obviously the most important day on of the week is match day. And, you know, nothing can recreate that that pressure or that buzz or that, you know, the adrenaline, the nerves that you've got running through you, um, which I suppose is pretty, pretty similar to um, if... If you're not being picked, if you're not playing, because you, you sort of feels at times like you're you're going through the motions, you're trying to get yourself ready, but you know deep down you know you you're not really got a chance of playing. But no, I think both are similar in terms of you, you've got to just keep working hard and you've got to just believe. And I think the mental side of it's massive um, because it's you know it's easy to write yourself off very quickly. I think you've got to you've got to constantly just keep moving forward and you know. Don't waste a day, don't waste a day of training, don't waste a day of rehab, whatever it may be. Make sure you, you get the maximum amount of it that you possibly can and so that when you get that chance, because, you know, football changes quickly. You know, one day you could be out of the team and, you know, not, never seeing how you're going to get a chance to get back in. But it does, it changes really quickly. And, you know, before you know it, you can be back in the team, you need to be ready to take that opportunity. So both pretty similar. How do you deal with the mental side of things then? Is it a case of like reading motivational books or, or speaking to someone? How, how does that all work? No, I, I think it's it's obviously a, ma a massive part of it. And I think as you get older, you learn from your experiences. Like I said, the experiences I've had in the past have you know, been massive learning clubs for me. And as you get older, you, you learn that it's, um, you know, it's important. I think the manager talks about it a lot in terms of, um, winning and losing matches. If we get a win, then it's or a couple of wins. It's you know we're not the best team in the world, and if we got a couple of lo uh, losses and we're not the worst team in the world, I think it's pretty important to try and stay as level as you can in football. And you know, realize that when you've when you've had a low, when you've you know you're struggling a little bit, it's important to try and stay on track yourself, and um, you know, concentrating on getting the best out of yourself. And you know, if you if you work hard enough and you believe it enough, you know, you, you'll you'll get what you deserve. That's interesting you say that because I was planning to ask you in recent weeks, obviously we've had a couple of results that have gone the other way and, and other teams have, have gained ground and suddenly the fan base are all worrying about Brentford being the best football team in the world and Swansea sneaking up on us. But I was going to ask how you guys, whether you have a similar swing in emotions, but it sounds like you keep a lid on it and keep things pretty, pretty smooth. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's important to realise that it, it doesn't, at this stage of the season, it doesn't really matter what anybody else does because if you're being honest, the point target is probably going to be what the point target's always been. We know that if we get to 90 points ish, then we've got a really, really good chance of going up automatic. So, you know, with so many games left, I think it's important to to keep that point target in mind and the next game's the most important. And if we get three points in the next game, um, you know, then that's fantastic and we can keep moving forward. Um, so I think a bit later on in the season, maybe two or three games to go, you maybe start having a look at what other teams are doing. But um, I think it's important to you know to realise the next game is the most important, and three points in the next game is all that matters. Um, and it's you know it, it is difficult. It's difficult not to you know try and keep an eye on what other teams are doing, and you know you might get a little buzz if you see somebody dropping points. But at the end of the day, at this stage of the season, it it, it doesn't really matter. Um, and you know we've had that experience because a lot of the lads in the squad have have been there and done it. Like I said, um, you know even the, even the young lads have experienced what it's like to to get promotion. Whereas you know other teams and other players maybe didn't have that experience, and it's sort of a different sort of pressure for them. You know when they get to the top, um, as uh, you know Brentford have, as Swansea have got a chance to. That's it. Sort of changes for them, and and the pressure changes. So you know it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. You talk there about the experience of gaining a promotion, but obviously the following season didn't go quite as planned. Obviously, project restart. You were injured then, weren't you? How frustrating was that? Not being able 
to help with you know trying to trying to keep the club back in the top flight. No, it was it was obviously massively frustrating for me. I think my season as a whole got off to obviously the worst possible start. Um, you know, it was it was difficult because it had a pre-season where I think I'd played nearly every minute because of injuries. Um, and obviously at the time I thought that was that was good for me because um, I wanted to play. I had hardly played the season before. I thought I've got a good chance of getting a run of games in pre-season and then start the season, you know, fit. But I probably overdone it in terms of what I'd done in pre-season, probably done too much. And I was going into the season struggling. Um, you know, I had a, there was a few issues. Um, you know, I just kept pulling my groin for whatever reason. I needed a um, hernia surgery, which I eventually had to get. So for me, getting back fit and I think getting in a better place where, like I've touched on before, I could actually go on the pitch and do myself justice. Um, you know, it was good for me. I felt like I had a run of games of 10, 15 games where, you know, I'd found a bit of form. And I think as a team as well, we'd, we'd, we'd found a bit of form. I know the results weren't always exactly what we wanted, but, um, you know, we were picking up points. We were very close to, um, you know, getting results at places. There weren't many games where we felt like we were blown away. I think I could probably only remember a couple where we were, um, you know, we were well beaten every game. It seemed like we, you know, we had a chance. Um, and then obviously the, the situation happened where the league stopped um, and it was probably, you know, for me personally, it was probably the worst possible timing because like I said, I think I was finding a bit of form and I was getting to run the team. And, and for the team as well, you know, we were getting a bit of consistency. We were, you know, we felt like we were almost there in a lot of games and if we carry that momentum on, then who knows what would happen. So that, that sort of, you know, that sort of was a massive setback for us in the time that it came. Um, but then after obviously the, Project Restrat, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a real struggle and, um, you know, we, we never really looked like being anywhere near it really for whatever reason, um, you know, I don't know, but obviously for me personally, it was tough to, it, it was tough to start to, to watch that, you know, when I, I felt like uh, I probably could have made a difference. I'm not saying if I'd have played, I'd have kept us up, but I'm saying I felt like I could have made a difference for the lads. You've had a taste of Premier League football now with, with a couple of clubs. Is it the be-all and end-all for you as a footballer? Does it? Do you just enjoy football more being in the Premier League and that's what drives you on? No, of course. it's um, Everybody knows it's, it's the best league in the world. And that, as a player, that's what you set out to do. You want to play at the highest level possible. And, you know, for us, that's the Premier League. Um so and and you know that's what we're striving for again. This season is all about getting back to the Premier League, and you know we put ourselves in a good position, and you know hopefully we can get there again. Especially after you know the young lads as well that for the taste of it, um, it, you know it is like I said, it's it's the best league, league in the world, and that's that's where you want to play your football. You've experienced the ups and the downs so far since your time at Norwich, but I just want to take you back actually to how you came to be at Norwich. Obviously, you had your spell at Newcastle before. How did you know Norwich were interested in, and what did you know about the city itself? Um, it actually happened really late in, in the window, um, and I think, to be fair to Newcastle, they were pretty good with me in terms of they told me pretty soon when the season finished that I could go. So obviously my goal that summer was was to was to get out and, and to get somewhere where I was going to play football, um, which isn't always as easy as that. Um, so the, you know there was there was a couple of clubs that were interested and there was there was things that were nearly done but it never quite happened and obviously I was I was pulling my hair out really because I was I was saying to my agent you know I'm going to be stuck here I'm going to be training with the young lads or training on my own I'm not going to be involved um, you know it's such a important part of uh, time in my career I was. 25, 26 maybe. So, you know, I needed, I knew I needed to be playing games. Um, and, you know, fair play to my agent. He was, he was really laid back and he, I trusted him and he said, look, relax, it'll happen. And eventually it did. Um, and it just, I, I was away with Scotland actually at the time. I was in a national duty um, and obviously got the phone call for um, my agent saying, Norwich are interested. I think it will, I think it'll happen. And, uh, Russell Martin and Stephen Naismith were in the squad at the time so you know that was quite handy it was ideal to be able to talk to them and you know hear what they had to say about the club and you know it was brilliant I think um, I, 
just speaking to them, I knew what I was going to be walking into. I knew how welcome in the club were going to be. I knew how well it was run. So, you know, for me, that sort of made my mind up there. And then, that, um, you know, I, re I really wanted to get it done. And actually, when I went, when I went down, I was, um, I travelled down with my agent, my dad. And, you know, my dad's always, he's, uh, his opinion always matters so much to me. And I think when he walked in and, um, you know, met Stuart and, and stuff like that, I think he knew straight away this is this one was right. So, um, you know, I always trust in his opinion and, uh, you know, he was right. I mean, I think since the second I walked in, everybody's been so welcoming and, um, you know, the club is so well run. It's so sort of family orientated that they make everybody feel so welcome. And it's, and it's sometimes it's a little touches as well. Like, um, I think after a couple of weeks, um, Delia invited my mum and dad and, and my partner in to have, uh, you know, dinner with them in the director's box before the games and stuff like that. And I think things like that make, you know, make a big difference. And I think they're really, um, they're really good on keeping the girls involved as well. You know, everybody's wives and uh, girlfriends and everything, they keep them, you know, really involved. And there's always stuff going on for them. I mean, it's not at the minute, obviously, what's going on, but, you know, they've got quite a good, um, you know, little social group between them as well, which is obviously a massive part of it. Thing I've got on the time right timelines right is obviously your your arrival coincided with Daniel's arrival. Who who came for, was Daniel in place by the time you were signed as a player? Yeah, yeah, he came obviously started that preseason. I came as I think the season had already started. It was obviously two two or three games in. Sure. So when you when you met him, what did they sell you on the vision of the direction the club was going that made you think, yeah, I, I like Norwich as a place. They've treated me really nicely. You know, uh, give me a nice welcome, but. But I like the the direction the club's going. This is the club for me. No, of course. I mean, obviously, that was um, as a player you want to play at the, the the highest level you can, and you know, a club that had aspirations to to play in the Premier League and get back to the Premier League. That's something I wanted to be involved in. Um, and like I said, obviously, Stuart and the manager have been a big part of that. And I think, you know, since I've been here, the changes have been you know unbelievable. If you look at the training ground now, and you look at the facilities. And obviously the plans I've got going forward is, is first class. And, um, you know, I think the, the place that the club's in is, you know, is, is, is really, really, really impressive. And I think they've done a great job on that. How did the facilities and the training ground compare to previous clubs you've been at, such as Newcastle and Blackburn? Um, I was really lucky at Blackburn because they, their facilities were really good. You know, they had everything you could ask for. They had... Um, Sort of indoor astro, outdoor astro, swimming pool, big gym, couple of big gyms, lovely big canteen. Um, it, they had everything you could ask for. It was, you know, it was really, 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 really well, well set up. Newcastle, not so much. I think they were, um, I think the players have been told a few times that they've got to be building this and they've got to be building that. Never really happened. Um, but like I said, coming to Norwich, the, the, the change has been, you know, unbelievable. I think it was, the training ground was mainly porter cabins when I arrived here. Um, the gym was in a tiny little conservatory. Um, I don't know if he's been, I don't know if you've seen it now, but, you know, the the gyms have got over a couple of floors. Um, you know, obviously they've done the academy building as well, which is unbelievable. Um, you know, it's definitely a club that's moving in uh, the right direction. I think it's... Uh, you know, a massive positive for the club. I think Stuart Webber might have mentioned once or twice some training pitches that did this. I don't know if you've seen him do that gesture, but he definitely, he definitely mentioned them a few times. But it must be refreshing, therefore. If you're saying at Newcastle, you were promised that things were going to change or the players were promised that things were going to change, getting that welcome from Stuart, being told this is these are our plans and then seeing them turn around in such a short period of time must be reassuring. No, of course, it is massively impressive. I know you're saying a bit... The pitch has been a bit like that, but the, the um, Crystal Magalas had a hill built for us to run up. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which some of the lads aren't too happy about, but no, definitely. No, I think it's you know it is reassuring. It is. I think it's just it's it, it's just so well run, and they've, they've got a vision for the club, you know, which is so impressive. Impressive, and you know they're they're producing on that as well, which I think you know is the main thing for players when you see that happening. You know you. Um, you know, only boost spirits and it, and it makes you, you know, proud to be at a club like that. 
so for your um, your first season here at Norwich, it was fairly uneventful, wasn't it? But you had that iconic moment with the the cross for Tim Close's 95th minute equaliser at Carroll Road against Ipswich. Does that rank against you sort of up there with your, your best moments so far? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think probably that it's sort of a blur to me. I, I, I don't really know what I was doing up there. I don't really know how it happened, but I think the the one thing that stands out is where I crossed it from was right in front of the Ipswich fans, and um, obviously I know how uh, how big a result it would have been for them if they had beat us. And I think just turning around and, and seeing their faces that's that's the one sort of image that sticks sticks in my mind. So no control of your celebrations then? <laughs> oh no, I just I just turned around and had a little look, and it was. That's football in it, and I know I got sent a couple of videos. I think some of their fans were filming in time for the final whistle, so they'd get the celebrations, and they actually caught me and camera celebrating in front of them. So uh, that was pretty. That that was pretty nice to see. Yeah, if you if you want to earn, uh, earn hero status early on, that's the way to do it: is celebrate in front of the Ipswich fans. Go on. As Alex mentioned, that first season was a difficult season. The first season under Daniel, uh, I guess you know someone comes in with a new vision players take time to buy into it. Were there any players who had previously been at the club who perhaps didn't buy in straight away and or didn't buy in at any point and, and moved on? I think it's... Um, I think not buying in is the wrong term because I think it takes time to, to actually understand it and put it into practice. So that's maybe why that first season, you described it as a bit uneventful. But, you know, it's a learning process and it takes time to... Um, to actually put it into practice and and, and make it work, um, and I think of course as well it takes certain type of players. So, you know, the manager Stuart make those decisions and what players can fulfil that and what players can't fulfil that. So I think it's you know that's part of it as well. It's it's their decisions on you know the incomings and the outgoings and who's got to do what. So, you know, I think it definitely does take a bit of time for that to sort of uh, come to. And like you said, the first. The first season was a bit uneventful, but, you know, I think in the long run, you know, you, you've seen what happened the season after. Um, you know, once once you sort of start putting the right people in the right places and the right players in the right places, it, you know, it comes together. And I think that's a massive thing for us, that the club's got an identity and the manager's got a, you know, a philosophy on how he wants to play football. And, you know, whatever happens, that's that's what we've got to do. And and that's what the, the players trust in and that's what we believe in. So, you know, whoever it may be, obviously... Games are different, different teams play different ways and you need to change, you know, accordingly. But, you know, the bottom line is we've got our philosophy and that's that's how we've got to play and that's what the players trust in. How much do you hear about that philosophy and identity and the goals, I guess, for Norwich from the manager himself and from Stuart Webber? What's your communication like with them? No, of course, every day the manager, obviously work very closely with the manager on terms of a daily basis and training and stuff and that's, the way he wants us to play is on the training pitch every day. So that's pretty, um, you know, that's pretty clear. Um, and, you know, it's it's really, it's not always on the training pitch. You know, we do a lot of work in, um, you know, in, in tactical meetings and stuff like that. Every game, we, you know, we'll go over and we'll analyse and we'll have a look at, um, you know, what we can do better. Even even games where, we've, you know, we've done really well and we've been comfortable and we've won well. You know, there's always, um, there's always the areas that the manager's, you know, putting demands on the players, and I think that's a big part of it as well. You know, the manager never, never settles for you know being good enough. He always wants more. He always, you know, demands off the players to improve. You know, which is a big part of it. I mean, I think for me personally, that's been a massive part of, um, you know, my career and and moving forward at Norwich. But I think with Stuart as well, it's um, it's something I never really experienced before in terms of having, you know, someone in Stuart's role, um, a sporting director work so closely with the players in terms of, you know, he's based at the training ground. So you see him on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, I think it's really good to have that relationship in terms of where, you know, you see him every morning and you can have a chat with him and, and, and stuff like that. So I think, you know, I think that's very be beneficial for the players to sort of have that relationship with, with Stuart as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously the identity and you talked earlier about having a senior group of players that helps you in your role as captain. And I know the club often talk about cultural architects. Who are the people within that senior group of players? Who are the cultural architects that help you set that tone? Um, I'd say, well, I think it's pretty obvious. You probably know there's, uh, you know, a big 
uh, Tim Krull, Zimbo. Kenny's probably part of that. Mickey McGovern, Alex Tetty, um, Timo, Ben Gibson, Jordan. You know, there is there is a fair few that um, you know have all got an opinion, and, and it is interesting as well because sometimes the opinions differ, and it's you know it's up to the lads to to, to chat about that and. Um, you know, sort of come to a decision, but th- that doesn't happen very often. You know, it's not like we have a chat every day and we're making a decision on something. You know, it's only, you know, certain circumstances that control that. But I think it's just the, the general attitude and the general behaviour of, you know, day to day life at the training ground, setting that example for the young lads, which I think is, um, you know, so important. You said it doesn't happen very often, but when it does and opinions do differ, how do you deal with that? Uh, no, I think it's obviously very, very important to hear everybody's different opinion because everybody's got a different opinion on everything. I think th- there's a good balance there between sort of lads that are at stages of career and um, lads that are at different ages. You know, I think what age is Tex? Is he 45 or something? <laughs> Tex looks on, uh, probably different to the rest of us, but you know, I think it's important that we, we have those discussions and, and we all get on the same page. And um, like I said, opinions differ, but you know, once you speak about it and you become a decision what's best for the group and what's best for the club, then, um, you know, it is, it is really good to have that group. That respect for each other extends to the respect for the wider staff, all of the people that are working together to, to move the club forward. And it extends to the fans as well. Because I know, Grant, I think you were amongst the players that were making calls to fans during, I think, the first lockdown. That that character, that characteristics of, of players is so essential, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think definitely. I think that's, um, that's a massive part of what the club is. You know, the club understand and the players understand how important the community is and we understand how important the fans are. And I think, uh, you know, really the lads that were making those calls, you know, it was really quite a humbling experience. So, you know, we speak to the fans and, and see how much that meant to them. You know, just having a phone call from one of the players, it was... You know, it was a really humbling experience, and I think I think the lads really enjoyed it. I think it was, um, you know, it was quite rewarding for the lads to, you know, to speak to the fans and you know ask how they're getting on, ask if they needed any help, see what they're, you know, if they had any worries or if they had any concerns, and and sometimes it was just a general chat, which was really, you know, it was really rewarding. It was, um, you know, especially at a time where you know things were really tough. It was, you know, it was, um, you know, it was definitely something that the lads enjoyed and. I think it's it just proves and it shows what you know what the club's all about. Yeah, how important is that connection with the fans? Because obviously you touched on it earlier about the fact that with the coronavirus situation, Carrow Road isn't packed out, and it would be incredible for us fans to be seeing what you're doing at the minute. But but you you can't lose that connection, can you? No, definitely not. I think it's um, you know, as players, it's you know it's really tough not having the fans there. So I think it's important to. Um, you know, to really try and keep that connection, and especially, like I said before, with the times where we were we were phoning around the fans, um, I think it's important to you know to realise that you know as footballers we are in a fortunate position um, in terms of our lifestyle, in terms of you know we're very we're very privileged, and you know other people maybe aren't that privileged, and they've maybe got other worries or other struggles. So you know, I think it's important to you know to try and give that a little bit back. Um, you know, and, and really just do all we can for the fans because, um, you know, we know how important we are for them. Do all of these things combined, Grant? And I know you talked about uh, how your partner's looked after as well. And I believe you're a dad as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do all of this combined really make Norwich feel like home for you? No, no, definitely. I think so. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It's been tough the last few months because obviously we're um, we're so far from family and friends. So. Um, you know, having a, having a baby that's been that's been pretty difficult. But um, you know, I think it's it, it's a massive part of it because we are so far away from home, and in terms of um, everybody's been on the same boat. Really, everybody that comes to Norwich is, is is you know quite far away from home, so it's difficult for them to have to see the families and friends. So and I think that's part of it and part of what the club is as well in terms of you know making it a really family oriented club and. Um, you know, try to make everybody feel as included as they can, and you know they do it really well. And like I said, it is you get that feeling as soon as you come here that it's, you know, it's really family orientated, and it, and it's all about you know keeping everybody together. 
before COVID, did your family used to come travel down from Scotland a lot to see you play? Yeah, my mum and dad have they've done a few miles over the years and they've uh, you know seen off a few cars. So they've um yeah, they they travel uh, you know, length and bridge of the country, they very rarely miss a game. So, you know, that's another thing that's been pretty difficult, especially for home games, you know, they've come down for a couple of days and sort of make make a weekend of it. And especially we're having, you know, a baby as well now. It's, you know, you're playing and obviously parents can't get to watch the game, but probably more importantly, you know, they can't get to see their, you know, their granddaughter growing up at, you know, obviously such a young age, seven months now when, you know, you don't get these times back, if you know what I mean. So, you know, that, that's been difficult for my partner as well. I mean, and her family really struggled to, you know, obviously to see the baby, which, which is tough, but, you know, that is what it is. And, you know, we just need to make sure that we, we stay strong and hopefully, you know, sooner rather than later, we can come at the other side of this. It sounds like you had a really strong support network growing up, uh, getting into football and throughout your career. That must be, must be really nice. No, definitely. I mean, in terms of my parents, I, I try hard not to, you know, underestimate what they've done or, you know, be unappreciated because they, they gave everything for me and they would, you know, would not have had the opportunities I've had if if it wasn't for them. And, you know, I know some lads aren't as lucky. So, you know, I make sure that I'm I'm really grateful for everything they, they've done for me. And even and even still, you know, they would uh, they, they do everything for us and, you know, they're really first class. Was the plan always for you to become a footballer? Did you have a plan B? I think if you asked any footballer, they'd, they'd probably say no. Obviously, I left school at 16 and football, that was what it was. And um, I actually moved away from home at 14. Um, I was playing for Crew Alexandra at the time. Um, and he dig, so I was, I think I was three and a half days at school and training and what have you. So, you know, from a young age, that's sort of what, what your goals are. Um, so, no, I don't think, if you were asking me the question, what would it be if I wasn't a footballer, then I don't know what the answer would be. Just as well that you are then, isn't it? But you yeah. touched your, on crew. You had quite a few different youth clubs, didn't you? Was it four Rangers were in there as well, weren't they? That must have been a bit weird moving around at such a young age. It was strange, but I don't think it was more moving around. I think it was more sort of seeing what it was like and make a decision. Obviously, my uh, local team was Queen of the South. They played Scottish Championship. They have been for quite a few years, I think, and Naturally, that was a team that I played for. Um, but I was going up to Rangers as well. I was never really signed on a contract at Rangers or whatever. I was always sort of um, up and down. But I was travelling down to Crewe from you know quite a young age. I think nine years old or whatever. I was travelling down to Crewe maybe a couple of times a month just to play in the games. And I think the big thing for me was Crewe have obviously got a, you know a very good reputation for um, you know bringing youth team. Uh, youth player through and that was that was obviously a massive attraction for us and I think seeing the setup how that compared to you know the clubs that had been in in Scotland that was a massive part of it and and decision making and I think from probably 12 um, you know I was traveling there every weekend my school holidays were spent there I was training there as much as I could and that's when we made the decision at 14 that would move down and um and obviously try and go down that route. And I had a couple of years at Crew, and it was actually a coach. It was a coach that took me to Crew, then moved to Blackburn. So he um, took me to Blackburn as well. So that's how that happened. That's quite young, I suppose, to be moving away from family. Has football improved in the way that it looks after players of that age who are t- sort of moved away from family? You know, how, how do Norwich look after its young academy players that? that are 14 and living away from home? No, I think it was, um, I think they're really, really good with the young players. I mean, I think it's um, it's not just about being a footballer. I think it's about being a person as well. And I think that's really important. I think for me, you know, my own personal experience, it, it makes you grow up quickly. You know, I know I was in digs and I had people looking after me, but, you know, you're away from home. You need to learn how to look after yourself. You need to learn how to be independent. Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a big part of it. And I think that, you know, it was really good for me, you know, long term in terms of being independent and being being able to look after myself. You know, you see a lot of young lads in football now that you know, haven't got a clue about what real life is, if that makes sense. So, you know, I think it's important for them to 
to try and get a grip of that early and, and realise that it isn't just football, there's a real world out there and you need to be able to look after yourself. You must feel a sense of pride as well in, in helping the younger players bed into the side over recent seasons. And, you know, how good was it to see Ben Godfrey get that move to Everton, having played such a key part, you personally, in his development? No, I think um, I think you don't need me to tell you that uh, Ben is going to be a top, top, top player, I think. You know, I would not be surprised to see Ben playing for you know one of the one of the biggest clubs in the world because he, he's got that ability and he's got that potential. Um, and obviously, when Ben came in, he was he hadn't really played that position before. So, you know, it was nice to be able to have have that chance to speak to him, to try and help him. And he was such a good lad as well. You know, he took everything on board. And um, but you know, sometimes he's just he's just that good. There was there was nothing really to tell him to to be honest. So. No, I think uh, Ben Godfrey for the future, I, I can see him you know, going right to the top. And one of Ben's attributes that people always talk about is his speed. Now, I know for a fact that you are severely underrated for the speed that you have. Um, I saw someone on Twitter the other day kicking off because a commentator talked about exploiting Norwich's lack of speed. It's pure uh, research, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Someone needs to have, to have a word with him and tell him to do the research properly. Am I right in saying you're one of the fastest? I think so, yeah. Do, have, yeah. do you ever just have flat out races at Colney? No, we never have a race, but they do. I think it was a couple of years ago now we've done a, it was like a sprint test that measured your, however, over how different distances and whatever. And, um, you know, I've done pretty well in that, but I think probably Shemi's taking that title now because he is, he is ridiculous. I forgot about he him. Is. Yeah, he but is. I don't mind it though. I don't, I don't mind going under the radar. I don't mind going under the radar because like you said, it's, Teams probably come and think we'll expose that side because there's a lack of pace, but I've, I've done all right so far. So there you go. Are, are you a competitive bunch, you guys? No, definitely, definitely, and I think that's um, that's the nature and the way we train as well. I think you know the, the demands that are set in terms of you know the standards in training, but you know also because in the quality that we've got in the squad, because you know there's a lot of lads that aren't getting as much game time as as they would like, which, um, you know, their opportunity to show why they should be playing is, is in training. And, you know, and it's the same for the lads that are in the team. They need they know they need to be, you know, performing every day to, to keep their space in the team. So, no, I think training is very competitive. And I think that's, you know, I'm a big believer. And the manager sort of sets that tone in terms of you train you the way you play. Um, you know, I don't think it's any secret how hard we train. So, you know, training is, uh, you know, really, really competitive. What's your relationship like with your fellow defenders? Yeah, not really good. I think it's, um, like I said, we're sort of more of the, the, the senior lads in, in the squad. So, you know, it's important for us to be sort of on the same page and, and um, you know, good work com- communication in terms of what's going on for the lads and, and everything like that. But, you know, I think it's, um, first of all, you know, they're just good lads. And like I said, it's everyone buys into the you know the same ethos that you know the club's the most important thing so um that's the way it is and I think it's it's important as well that we that we push each other because obviously the formation we're playing at the minute we know that there's only got to be two years that are playing on the game day so you know it's up to the other one to make sure he's on top top form to you know to push the lads to make sure we're playing at our best to you know to keep our place in the team which is which is massively important and that and that competitive side is you know is, is really important for the you know, for the team moving forward. Uh, the defensive side of things is an area that's actually really improved. I mean, there's so many games, especially in the first half of this season, where we've won by a single goal. And that's thanks to the fact that you guys are keeping clean sheets and, and keeping the opposition at bay. Oh, I mean, I think first and foremost, as, as a defender, that's your, um, you know, that's what you take pride in. You take pride in your, you know, your your goal conceded record and, you, and your clean sheets. Um so it is a massive part of it. I mean, especially in in the championship, but even more so the way it is at the minute. You know, the, the fixture list is is so hectic. There's the games are going to be so tight. So, you know, it's important for us to, you know, to keep it really tight at the back and you know, trust in the quality that we've got in the front end of the pitch to um, you know, to win us a game. I hate to touch on it, but we kind of have to just to get your thoughts on it. But obviously the start of last season in the Premier League at Anfield was a difficult time for you. How did you come back from that? Because you scored the own goal there, didn't you? And that was the first 
goal conceded in the Premier League last season. How did you kind of turn that around into a positive? Do you know how many um, quiz questions that's been on? <laughs> how many texts <laughs> I've had? There you go, done. Honestly, quiz answer. <laughs> honestly, it's, it's constant. Every, every couple of weeks I get someone text me, you would answer my quiz tonight. <laughs> you scored the first goal of, the, of that season. But no, it was tough. Listen, it was... You know, for me, it was it was a big chance for me. It was a big opportunity to get myself in the team, and I had a I had a chance to play. And you know, for that to happen after five ten minutes of the game, whatever it was, was um, you know, was really tough. It was difficult to take. Um, but I mean, like I said before, and I've touched on experiences in the past. You know, these things you can you can either fold and you can either crumble under the pressure, or you can you know learn from it and and move on and. And make yourself better, and you know, I'd like to think that I've I've done that. At the time that it happened was a difficult time for me, anyway, in terms of injuries, because I think as as a player, you know, in your your heart of hearts that you shouldn't really be playing, and you need to take a time out. And you know, it ended up me having um, a couple of surgeries, but you know, the circumstances were we had no centre half fit, so it was either I play or you know someone played out of position, so. You know, I felt like I owed it to the club. I felt like I owed it to my teammates at the time to to go through that. And listen, that's got nothing to do with scoring an own goal, but that is the, the situation I was in at the time and eventually I ended up having a couple of surgeries, which was probably good for me because I was, like I said, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was playing it what I could potentially play at. I didn't feel like I was doing myself justice. And to have the couple of surgeries and to take a bit of time to get myself, you know, physically and mentally right, I think to get back in the team and, you know, have a run of games, I felt like I was, you know, I was doing myself justice. So those text messages you're receiving from people, obviously for, from your mates, who are your big mates in football and especially at Norwich? Uh, especially at Norwich, there's a, there's, there's a group of us that are quite tight, I'd say probably uh, Timo's a good lad. It's quite quiet, Timo, but he's uh, he doesn't mind the beer. <laughs> um Stipe, Kenny, obviously Ben, uh, Jordan. So no, it's a, it's a good group, um, and they're probably lads that of um, more of the more of the sort of old school banter, if you like, um, quite lively in the dressing room. Um, but it's important. It's important to have that that balance. I don't think you could have everybody like that. It's important to have the lads that are, um, you know, your young lads that are a little bit quiet and your your lads that are, you know, ultra professional. I think it's um, it's important to have to have that in the dressing room that they make sure everybody's inclusive. You know, there's nothing worse than being in the dressing room. Like I've been in the past where it it gets a bit clicky, and you've got little groups of lads that will go and sit and have their lunch together every day, or they'll go and um, socialise together away from everyone. I think it's important to have that balance, and you know, have that um, that group that's all together in the dressing room. I definitely say it's like that in Norwich. Where do you place yourself on that scale then? Uh, probably in the middle somewhere. Which is what you need from your captain, surely. Yeah, if you say so. <laughs> and finally, what does Norwich mean to you as a place and the club, of course? I mean, first of all, as a place, I think we we love living here. I think, obviously, our daughter was born here and, um, you know, it's got to be a big part of her um, early years of her life. So it's, you know, it's all, it'll always be a place, especially us. But I think, obviously, just the, the city as well and, um, you know, going into the city, seeing how friendly everyone is and feeling so welcome in a place. It's, you know, it, it does feel like a really nice place to live. Um, and I think for, for the club, I think it's difficult to to describe it for me, but I think I'm just grateful for, you know, the opportunity that I've been given here. I think, um, you know, knowing how low football can get and knowing how much it can be a struggle to come here and get an opportunity and, you know, to, to really feel part of something, you know, I think I'll always be grateful for that. And, you know, I've said it before in interviews, I think that everybody here is on the same, is on the same boat. I think everybody owes everything to the club, owes every opportunity that they've, they've, they've been given to the club. And, um, you know, that, that's why, you know, it means so much to me and it means so much to, you know, to everyone in that squad um, to make sure that they, they give their absolute all for Norwich City and for the fans, because, you know, they ought to the club. That is so good to hear. Thank you so much, Grant, for joining us on the podcast. Great to have you on today and good luck for the rest of the season. All the best. Thanks very much. Cheers, Grant. Thank you. Cheers.